Greetings, aliens and strangers and ye fellow homesick sojourners. First Peter tells us this wonderful news. Dear friends, I urge you, as aliens and strangers in the world, to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Notice that it doesn't say, dear friends, as people who feel like aliens and strangers in the world. Nope. It actually calls us out as aliens and strangers in a hostile territory. This place, this crazy place, is not home. Isn't that good news? That's the best news I've heard all week. That makes my heart finally feel aligned right with everything. That knowledge opens upon my mental horizon the possibility of hope and the faith that I need to stand and keep alert for the coming of the bridegroom. The older I get, the crazier this place becomes. And the more I read the scriptures and get to know my Lord, the more I long for Jesus to come and reign supreme forevermore. The book of Revelation tells us that one day all things will be made right under the throne of the King of Kings. John testifies to us that he saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. And he saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their forehead or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Brothers and sisters, one day, one glorious day, all things are going to be made right. This isn't just justice. This is a complete and utter reversal of the devil's lies and the consequences of those lies throughout the ages. Doesn't your heart long for that grand and glorious day? G.K. Chesterton, when comparing what the world calls good, or actually what the world calls optimism, with what the Bible calls good and optimistic, writes these words, and I find them extremely valuable for our times, in which naturalistic religions and paganisms are growing by leaps and bound among, bounds among our children, and the sections in the bookstores are getting larger than the Christian section. All the same, writes Chesterton, it will be as well if Jones does not worship the sun and the moon. If he does, there's a tendency for him to imitate them, to say that because the sun burns insects alive, he may burn insects alive. He thinks that because the sun gives people sunstroke, he may give his neighbor measles. He thinks that because the moon is said to drive men mad, he may drive his wife mad. This ugly side of mere external optimism had also shown itself in the ancient world, about the time when the Stoic idealism had begun to show the weaknesses of pessimism. The old nature worship of the ancients had begun to show the enormous weaknesses of optimism. Nature worship is natural enough while the society is young. Or, or in other words, pantheism is all right as long as it is the worship of pan. But nature has another side, which experience sin are not slow in finding out. And it is no flippancy to say of the God Pan that he soon showed the cloven hoof. The only objection to natural religion is that somehow it always becomes unnatural. A man loves nature in the morning for her innocence and amiability and at nightfall if he is loving her still it is for her darkness and for her cruelty. He washes at dawn in the clear water, as did the wise man of the Stoics, yet somehow at the dark end of the day he's bathing in hot bull's blood, as did Julian the apostate. The mere pursuit of health always leads to something unhealthy. Physical nature must not be made the direct object of obedience. It must be enjoyed, not worshipped. Stars and mountains must not be taken seriously. If they are, we end where the pagan nature worship ended. Because the earth is kind, we can imitate all her cruelties. Because sexuality is sane, 
we can all go mad about sexuality. Mere optimism had reached its insane and appropriate termination. The theory that everything was good had become an orgy of everything that was bad. Sounds like today. He goes on this mental journey until he arrives at final truth. And it is this truth which Christians must always remember if their love, their joy, and their optimisms are to be placed properly and aligned properly with the coming reign of Jesus Christ. He writes, My haunting instinct that somehow good was not merely a tool to be used, but a relic to be guarded like the goods from Caruso's ship. Even that had been the wild whisper of something originally wise. For according to Christianity, we were indeed the survivors of a wreck, the crew of a golden ship that had gone down before the beginning of the world. But the important matter was this, that it entirely reversed the reason for optimism. And the instant the reversal was made, it felt like the abrupt ease with which a bone is put back into the socket. I had often called myself an optimist to avoid the too evident blasphemy of pessimism. But all the optimism of the age had been false and disheartening for this reason that it had always been trying to prove that we fit into the world. The Christian optimism is based on the fact that we do not fit into the world. I had tried to be happy by telling myself that man is an animal like any other which sought its meat from God, but now I really was happy, for I had learned that man is a monstrosity. I had been right in feeling all things as odd, for I myself was at once worse and better than all things. The optimist's pleasure was prosaic, for it dwelt on the naturalness of everything. The Christian pleasure was poetic, for it dwelt on the unnaturalness of everything in the light of the supernatural. The modern philosopher had told me again and again that I was in the right place, and I had still felt depressed, even in acquiescence. But I had heard that I was in the wrong place, and my soul sang for joy like a bird in spring. The knowledge found out and illuminated forgotten chambers in the dark house of infancy. I knew now why grass had always seemed to me as queer as the green beard of a giant and why I could feel homesick at home. Is all of this making you feel homesick? When I drive by the ABC store and see the glowing open sign, yet we must keep the doors of the church closed, I feel a little homesick. When I find out that in places like California that part of the essential list of you can stay open includes marijuana dispensaries, but the church must remain closed, I feel a little homesick and a little insane. When I drive past a full parking lot for pick your own strawberries, knowing that I will be the only car in the parking lot of the church, I get a little frustrated, sad, and angry, and Truth be told, at times tremblingly on the verge of mental insanity, I am pulled back to see the real picture. Booze, weed, and strawberries all have their homes here in this place, while my home is over yonder. And when that roll is called, I will be there amongst the sane and peaceful people of God and forever ruled over by a sovereign that loved me and will never lie to me. There is a higher bread and there is a higher wine. There is a real milk and a real honey and a real land that we come from. And right at the beginning, Jesus helps us find our way by reminding the devil and everyone else that man cannot live on bread alone. And when it 
it comes to getting this higher and loftier food. You don't need a mask. You don't have to stand in line and you don't have to exchange money through a cough resistant plastic shield. Nope. Those days are drawing to an end. And when they end, well, when they end, you will be safe, you will be warm, and you will be full till you can't eat anymore. Oh dear. That doesn't quite paint the picture well at all. Let me read straight from the source of water that flows from Mount Zion into our strange land and promises that if we keep walking the river's edge, that one day we will arrive back home, back at the spring of living water. And the source says, and the river rumbles, come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the riches of fair. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you, because the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord in the heaven. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and you will be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper and instead of briars the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. Homesick yet? God bless you, and I hope to see you soon.